Hey guys, um, thank you for joining uh, today's panel for the future proof of stable coins, the existing and the future innovations of stable coins. Uh, welcome to this. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm the CEO and a co a founder of Robo CX, a Canadian based uh, cryptocurrency exchange. It's glad to be back for the Futures Conference uh, the second time. And we also prepare some nice gift for you. Please visit our virtual booth to get $20 for every single verified users. Um, and today, I'm very excited to have uh, such a, you know, high quality stablecoin panels with me today. And uh, we have, uh, you know, Jennifer Shinhaji from the, from the NakedDAO Foundation. We have uh, Alexa uh, from, from the Neutrino Protocol USDM project. We have uh, Amir Roski, co-founder of the Blog Geeks. And we also have um, uh, Chief Compliance Officer uh, Leo from Tether currently experiencing a little bit technical issue and will be joining us very shortly. But without further ado, I would like to kick this off. Um, so stablecoin, obviously, in the past uh, few months, few years have been really exploding. And we have seen its market cap have grown over $20 billion. And stablecoin in the past has been mostly used a way to hedge trading risks. And wherever you feel the risk of a market, you try to sell it. But in the past several months, we have seen this situation has changed. The use cases of the stablecoin actually has been ever expanding, St uh, from you know being hugely you know deployed into the network, you know to fulfilling the global payments and remittance purpose. It has been widely kind of coming to the daily life of everybody. So today I'm actually going to just start with uh, Jennifer here, um, since we are actually have seen such a big booming in DeFi space in the past several months. You know, we have seen the DeFi token price going up like rocket, and we have seen the value of being actually locked in the DeFi ecosystem have been ever expanding as well. Um, so I guess like my question to you, the first question is, since Make It Dow, you know, the DAI project is one of the biggest one and the earliest one in the industry, promoting kind of, you know, the DeFi concept here. So how do you see uh, the DAI project going forward and what will you, I guess, do differently, uh, I guess, in accordance with um, this massive trend for the DeFi world? Hey, everybody. Um, so, yeah, the MakerDAO protocol has been live since um, 2017 with the first version, which was referred to as single collateral die. And now we're on version two, which is almost uh, launched almost a year to date, uh, last November, which is referred to as multi-collateral die, which allows for um, many different types of assets to be used to generate die in the protocol. So, um, you know, looking at kind of the the growth really of die and die circulation in the last few months, because um, there's just been such um, you know high amount of activity, primarily driven by um, a lot of the yield farming during the summer months and a couple months ago um you know die is now at this milestone of unless i haven't checked in the last half hour but unless we've uh, crossed that bridge we're almost at one billion die in circulation which is like a massive number um so that's that's really um huge you know thinking in terms of a couple years ago, there were debt ceilings. The amount of dye that was able to be generated off of ETH were, you know, only, you know, a million, you know, hundred million. And now we're at this one billion mark, which is just um, really significant. So, you know, thinking about like where, where, where do we go next? Um, how does this continue? You know, we we kind of keep it very focused on the original um you know mission was which was to create this decentralized digital currency that could be used by anyone anywhere in the world without going through a central authority um and having this open financial um access so that that continues to remain constant um you know i sit on the business development team so a lot of my time is spent uh talking to the the developers and infrastructure projects um you know so thinking about exchanges on and off ramps wallets um all the financial applications that need a stable coin um to power their applications so right now we have over 
800 different platforms that are using DAI or the Maker Protocol in some way. So, you know, the growth has really been um, uh, consistent, you know, since since this started. And we've seen some areas regionally that have really picked up momentum, in particular um, in Argentina and Latin America, where they truly have a, um, a need beyond just speculating um, assets and you know yield farming. They actually are looking for an alternative currency to their own, which is very much challenged by inflation and by you know the government policies on on their own currency. So Dai has really been embraced there in the past year plus um, because they you know that region was also very open to Bitcoin as a concept of an alternative uh, currency. But then with Dai having those similar similar attributes of decentralization and censorship resistance, but providing that very much needed stability to really use it as a store of value and a medium of exchange, um, that 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 was a quick, um, you know, kind of understanding. So, you know, we've continued to grow. Our mission is, you know, kind of continuing um, just providing dye to um, different parts of the world, making it available, you know, working with builders to have those tools to support DAI. And so, yeah, it's, it's been really exciting to see the growth. Yeah, thank you so much for the input. And certainly, uh, congrats again, you know, for DAI breaching the $1 billion threshold. Obviously, this is, uh, I guess, one of the few stable coin projects has, you know, really exceeded that uh, massive kind of adoptions here. So I just want to you know stay here for one more question for you, uh, Jennifer. Um, so as we all know that you know Dai has made its mechanism change in the past several months from single collateral to multi collateral, and we have seen you guys have trying to expand the collateral that can be used to issue Dai. So from some of the you know analysts in the industry trying to say okay, and and also being mentioned very interestingly by some early panels talking about Dai potentially being a central bank of the crypto world, you know, trying to decide which quality, which type of uh, cryptos can be actually used as collateral to issue DAI. So that's kind of give a really big endorsement for the collateral, for the asset being chosen by DAI, being able to issue a stable coin based out of that. So I guess uh, this question for you is, so going forward, how would you guys kind of leverage this multi-collateral system to ever even, you know, expand the central bank kind of concept here and uh, in, the, in the future, uh, do you see there's going to be a, a, a strong growth of the collateral pool uh, in the future? Yes. Yeah, so one of the um, developments that have kind of come with the multi-collateral dies upgrade since last year was really having the maker community, um, you know, be able to operate and, um, you know, do what is intended to have this decentralized protocol managed. Um, so any MKR holder or anybody, an enthusiast can participate in decentralized governance. You need MKR to actually vote, but they are truly the, the stewards of running the protocol and it is entirely um, in their hands to onboard the collateral type that you've been seeing added since um, we launched. So. Uh, we have a really, we have the framework in place now where they can more quickly assess and onboard assets. And so, you know, we we have, a, you know, I'm losing track now, but I think almost 15 new assets that have been voted in. And there's a number of proposals, collateral applications that have been proposed other by other um, projects that want to have their token accepted as collateral in the system. Or it could be anybody, somebody like yourself, Adam, that says, you know, I really want to see, um, you know, a particular token in the maker system. You can just on your own create an application, post that into the maker forum, and then that takes on this process of evaluation by the maker community, all within a transparent, transparent way in the maker forum. So if that's goes through the the uh, kind of steps, and there's enough interest, there will be a poll that's um, taken to see if there's enough interest to have that put up for an actual executive vote. So having having these frameworks in place um, has provided, you know, the maker community an ability to more quickly onboard collateral assets. Um, so that's that's been a really interesting to see 
And then, you know, with that, the kind of the next step of, of what types of assets um, are real world assets. So not ERC-20 tokens, but actually tokenized assets, whether those are trade finance, invoices, um, you know, music streaming royalties, um, something else, you know, some type of other real world asset that um, can be tokenized and, and have us have a way to be onboarded and generate die. Those conversations are and um, those conversations are taking place in the forums, and there's um, quite a bit of legwork that's been done done amongst, amongst those community members to actually start seeing that come to life. Um, so real world assets are, are probably you know closer than they've ever been to seeing um, them executed. But yeah, there's there's a lot more momentum and ability to make decisions um, based on the way that the, the uh, community has, has been set up. Amazing. <clears throat> really glad to hear this decentralization governance pro and also connecting the real world assets. I think that's uh, very much you know, expected. And uh, I think we will definitely stay very tight close on that. So I'm, I'm next, I'm gonna actually jump to Alexa on this. So US DM project is very interesting to my mind. So you guys are trying to like really to kind of promote an easy way of people to receive yields without really fussing about, you know, the yield farming and you have to go to different different protocol to do your own yield farming. So what do you do actually differently trying to have a very unique advantage? And the why, like what's the typical, uh, I guess uh, the holders of USD and they want to do differently in, 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 the, in the industry. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, congrats uh, with nice achievement, actually. Uh, USDN Neutrino Stablecoin was inspired from Maker, actually. Uh, also, uh, with, uh, altogether with uh, Basis, the projects haven't been launched. Uh, Unfortunately, but uh, with combination of both, we created uh, Neutrino stablecoin. And the, the most uh, important differentiation here is the original uh, blockchain, uh, which is actually uh, in, in its native currency, which is using as a collateral. So we have Ethereum, and in Ethereum, we don't have uh, any kind of uh, staking of native currency yet. Probably we'll have one in the future. but. In Waves blockchain, we have uh, we have staking, uh, and uh, this staking uh, has almost like six six percent per year, and uh, this native currency is actually actually stakeable. So using this uh, native token as a collateral, you can create uh, an algorithmic stablecoin, uh, which is actually uh, very interest as well, and uh, uh, based and if we are looking at how many people are actually staking uh, algorithmic stablecoin USDN and how many are trading that, we have also leverage here. So uh, the staking interest for uh, Neutrino stablecoin is uh, a bit higher than uh, 6%. It's around uh, 10%. And actually, the, the interest rate is increasing if uh, collateral price is growing. So this is um, a bit different approach, how it works. and. Uh, uh, and it's actually pretty nice because there is no interest rate uh, for issuing this asset. Then you are issuing this asset, it means that you are actually uh, so you're, you are selling uh, native currency waves to the stable coin. So there is no uh, there is no wolf, there is no um, interest rates you have to pay, there is no liquidations, etc. And uh, it works, but our main goal is uh, actually tokenization more and more assets like real world assets, euro, gold, etc., Bitcoin also. And uh, since we launched Gravity Protocol, which is uh, interchain protocol, interchain communication protocol between existing systems like uh, Tron, Binance Chain, Ethereum, Waves, etc., and more chains to come, uh, our focus is actually uh, to bring uh, Neutrino, Stablecoin, and another Neutrino assets into those uh, ecosystems. So in that case, uh, then, you are using, for example, uh, Ethereum version of uh, Neutrino, uh, you are rewarding just by holding. And if you are staking uh, this stable coin into uh, Uniswap, Muniswap, or into Curve, you are also earning interest just by holding because we, we are using gateways and uh, it's everything is stake stakeable. So we joined this kind of like farming uh, hype also 
uh, we partnered with different uh, projects already on Ethereum blockchain. Uh, for example, uh, MooniSwap, uh, One Inch Curve, etc. We have a lot of liquidity on Curve, and uh, uh, right now, uh, Neutrino stablecoin is the second uh, stable algorithmic stablecoin on the market. Uh, we are trying to uh, <laughs> we are trying to go uh, forward and uh, um, gain more and more traction here, and I think that. Um, uh, we did pretty nice job, uh, and actually, community uh, did pretty nice job because without community, you can't uh, do anything. So, uh, as I said before, we uh, focused on interchain. We are focused on moving uh, tokens into different ecosystems, bring more liquidity there, and uh, this is our goal here. Um, yeah. Uh, so, DeFi is actually pretty hot right now, and I think this uh, this uh, interchain DeFi will be like a logical step. Uh, in the, in the next years. So, um, I think I'm off. I'm done. Yes. Yeah, so that's actually uh, very interesting to bring out. I, see, I do see there are some commonalities between Jennifer and you talking about potentially trying to bridge that real asset world and opening up the door of the crypto asset to the real world. So there's one market that I have been always being very bullish on is the synthetic ethics markets. Because stablecoin, we can see it being used by you know so different, uh, you know so many different other countries. They have their, their own different currency denominated stablecoins, and the FX market is having a trading volume of five trillion dollars every single day. Right, it's really large large markets. So I do notice that you know there's one um, you know potential I guess idea a service that uh, nutrition uh, dollar you know USD and trying to fulfill is to open up the synthetic FX markets. So do you really see you know, the attractions being made in this particular FX uh, market? And do you see uh, in the future that this idea will be adopted by many countries ahead? Uh, this question is really hard because uh, then you look at the crypto, it's actually a pretty close cool system. I mean, it's incredibly hard for people outside crypto to join. And uh, the more currencies we'll have, uh, like more stable coins like euro usd etc the more adoption uh, chance for adoption we have but um, in practice uh, we saw that uh, any attempts uh, to bring uh, people outside from outside uh, they are much harder than attract people uh, who are already using crypto or who is already within the system so in that case uh, we actually have to balance between both uh, we have to balance and attract uh, already like uh, active community from from the crypto to different protocols to let them uh, diversify holdings uh, like you know uh, increase uh, different kind of like uh, portfolios assets etc. Uh, but yeah, uh, we have to play uh, as a like system players uh, within the whole crypto space. I mean, only whole crypto space can attract uh, new users because they will read. A lot of information they will find the same and same names etc and they will be convinced that okay crypto is safe i can join uh you can't do it alone so uh, this is pretty important thing and of course i see a lot of attempts to tokenize stocks and uh, gold etc but it's opposite to like mainstream i think that uh this is not for non-crypto actually this is uh, as a diversification uh chance for existing crypto users because they are like somehow uh, experienced and they need more and more assets to to hedge uh to hedge volatility etc so uh tokenization of like uh real assets like tesla for example this is neutrino tesla <laughs> and uh, stock markets indexes uh like commodities etc will be pretty nice offer for them but it's, yeah uh this is this is pretty hard work to do and uh, i'm not sure that uh, it will help somehow uh, in the short term uh, to attract more uh, like non-crypto users. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. So the, the, in terms of the stablecoin use cases, I think the industry itself has to hold hands together to make more allocations and to make more people aware of the potential use cases here. And it certainly cannot be achieved by a single one project that has been done you know, collectively by the industry. Um, so I just actually got a signal uh, from the director that you know, Leo finally got on, uh, on the back. So uh, maybe we can bring Leo on. Uh, hey, Leo, can you hear us? Hey, everyone. Yeah, I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, glad to finally join. Better late than never. Yeah, finally. Uh, we're actually on the highest attack you know, conference 
in Canada, but you know, there's some technical just have to overcome. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so, uh, thanks Leo for joining. Uh, so Leo is actually the Chief Compliance Officer of Tether. So I'm actually going to right now turn the question to you. Um, so obviously, USDT, uh, uh, you know, one of the you know most famous brand in, in the Tether group, has been you know the earliest, uh, I guess, uh, one of the earliest uh, player in the stablecoin industry, and obviously has made it the largest attraction in the world. Uh, with currently almost over 75% you know, of the total market share. So I think there's one thing that I guess you, I guess the our audience would really like to know is, you know, going forward, what will you be like be excited about? You know, where do you see that Tether can be used and where Tether will be actually expanding, I guess, more use bases. So I guess we would like to hear some of your future thoughts on this. Sure, thanks. That, that's a good question. And I guess the, the interesting thing about Tether is that uh, although it was kind of a novel idea when it was launched, um, the technology itself isn't all that complicated. The protocol we use isn't that complicated. So uh, aside to, of and, and in addition to the, the maintenance of the technology, it's really the, uh, the legal, the compliance, um, and the financial framework uh, that uh, underpins tethering as part of the, the engine that actually drives it. And, um, you know, the whole point of Tether is that it's supposed to be uh, sort of a compl as a complementary tool to other services within uh, the crypto industry. Um, it's not really meant to be a competitor to fiat. Uh, rather, it, what it does is it serves services where fiat is less efficient. And so not surprisingly, the main use cases have been in the digital world and in, in the digital space. So, you know, a lot of things come as a big surprise to me. So, I, you know, I didn't see, for example, yield farming coming uh, about, but, um, you know, it's clear that something like Tether will uh, help make those markets more efficient. And so the idea of what Tether is doing is we want to launch on as many protocols as possible because we don't know where the next big idea is going to come from. And so we really want to have our fingers in a lot of uh, pies so that we can really help the, the industry grow uh, a lot. Um, that, that said, though, uh, from amongst our own line of products, I, I am pretty excited about our XAUT, our gold-backed uh, product. Um, I think it offers uh, a new way to think about a very old product. And so for the first time, you, you're able to custody gold and kind of belong the gold price, while at the same time being able to do things like sure. it out and... Um, you know, it would be interesting to see if other uh, industry players can find other uses for it. But uh, re really, I think for, for Tether, the most exciting thing is to just keep launching on more protocols and listening to our customers uh, to understand where they want to, to see us. And, and that's where we will be. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so one other thing that I, I do want to touch base on as well is... Um, in the recent times, we have seen obviously you know more and more regulatory, I guess, I guess uh, definitions and regulatory, I guess, uh, understanding about the stablecoin industry. And they're trying to find their own way to define, you know, the stablecoin. So I think it's not only for the fiat backed stablecoin, but also could be for crypto backed stablecoin as well. But I think you know, uh, since you're you know the chief compliance officer for Tether, you probably have been kind of uh, you know going through this months multiple yeah. times trying to figure out you know where where like you know uh, Tether might. You know, kind of face or what Tether might to face actually in the future in, in terms of the regulatory challenges. So maybe you can just quickly share a few thoughts with us regarding uh, the potential, I guess, uh, regulatory uh, hurdles or regulatory opportunities rather. You know, for Tether to go even more internationally. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I, I think we all saw that uh, the Financial Stability Board recently released their thoughts on. Um, how stable coins should be regulated in the future. And, and of course, Tether will always endeavor to, you know, abide by regulations and, and ensure that we comply with all the laws. And, you know, even right now, we, we of course, verify all our users and we conduct uh, KYC and DDD and comply with law enforcement and file SARS in, in various jurisdictions. Uh, but when it comes to net new regulations, I think it's important to really come together in unity as a whole uh, system. It shouldn't be just kind of Tether speaking its own mind, but it's necessary for multiple projects to, to really uh, come together and speak to regulators because they, uh, it seems as though potentially some of these regulations are actually 
um, uh, a reaction to a very specific model of a potential um, stable coin that was going to come out, which I think has even been abandoned since then. And uh, there's a lot of assumptions that are made and not explained well. So even the idea that uh, regulations have to come about because stable coins are a danger to financial stability and can create financial instability. Uh, that, that's that's the the purpose that's that's been said to be. However, financial stability wasn't even defined, uh, yeah. or financial instability, and so it seems very odd to me that we're solving we're cr- trying to create a solution for a problem when the problem hasn't even been defined. And I think, generally speaking, when we think of financial instability, we're either talking about something like uh, hyperinflation which is something that uh, 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 a currency-backed stablecoin wouldn't create. If anything, it would be taken along for the ride by whatever uh, currency is backing it. So I don't think we're worried about that. On the other hand, when we're thinking about financial instability, we're probably thinking about um, kind of a, a sudden uh, and, uh, and violent fall in the prices of assets. Now, those uh, sorts of falls usually happen in response to um, a breakdown in the in the price discovery mechanism. So for example, when we're looking at the, the, the housing collapse in 08, we had a situation where uh, banks weren't really incentivized to, um, let's say, propagate and communicate what their risk evaluations were. Then you had organizations that were risk rating these products uh, were for whatever reason um, unable to properly risk rate them, and consumers had no ability to risk rate uh, some products that were backed by assets. And so you had a breakdown in the price discovery mechanism. Uh, stable coins, particularly the, the, the currency backed ones that are popular right now and, and are successful right now, have a much easier uh, price discovery mechanism. Basically, you have two types of market participants. You have the primary market participants that in Tether's cases are verified Tether users who can um, acquire Tethers on a one-to-one ratio or redeem them on a one-to-one ratio for fiat. And everyone else is a secondary market participant. And so what you, do, what you have is a case where on any secondary market, any exchange, if the price of Tether, for example, uh, fell um, to 95 cents, uh, the primary market participants are economically incentivized to go in and arb that price back to uh, something very close to, to, to a one-to-one ratio. And same thing the other way around. When uh, the price is at $1.05, then the primary market participants are incentivized to buy it on a secondary market and go to Tether and, um, and sell it over there for fiat. And so it's a very, um, what you get is it's, 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 a, it's a very clear, very, transparent price discovery mechanism that stablecoins have. In addition, uh, a lot of the stablecoin uh, projects also have the ability to, to freeze funds, to track funds, and, and to work quite closely with, uh, with law enforcement. And we've seen how that works in, in some of the recent hacks. And, and so I really do think that when uh, regulators are taking a look at what stablecoin projects are and how to regulate them, they ought not to just try to fit, uh, you know, a, a, a round peg through through a square hole. Um, it, it really, it, we need to consider what kind of risks they actually pose, and what kinds of uh, risk mitigation controls they also have. Uh, that said, though, I do expect there to come or some some regulations to come, and I hope that the the industry as a whole can really. Um, prepare and and be of one voice when we communicate with uh, regulators worldwide, because then I think we'll have a better chance of getting not just fair, but uh, effective regulations. Um, So those are kind of my thoughts on on what are the regulations to come. Thank you for the message. These kind of regulations definitely needs to be shared among different fiat-backed stablecoins. And I think for the stablecoin industry in general, you know, trying to work together with the regulator, trying to find a way in the future. So it's not going to be really, you know, trying to limit the developments of stablecoin being used in more more cases. So I'm going to just, uh, you know, turn to Amir uh, for a few questions here. Um, so obviously, you know, stablecoin has been so hot talk, you know, talk in the you know crypto industry. 
every crypto users will have certain kind of stable coins in the wallet, you know, in either ways. But I guess like, you know, all, for the outside of the uh, industry, people are not really particularly understanding what is the stable coin. So one question for you is, you know, in terms of the, I, I guess the education perspective and how do we kind of leverage kind of more social media, more channels for people to understand what is stable coin. So uh, maybe you can give us some insights on that. Yeah, it's a good question. But I think people approach it the wrong way. Most people will approach it with the, how do we create content to start educating people when at the beginning, 99% of people aren't aware or really don't care. You always have to meet people where they are in the journey of anything in life. And so instead of us trying to, hey, like scream at them, hello, hi, this thing exists, you need to figure out how can I implement this thing as an incentive model to a habit that they're already doing. All right, so you need to amplify a current habit and the biggest mistake that I see within the Web3 space, what they're doing is everyone's building silos. And it kind of makes sense right now because you want to kind of cater towards a crypto audience because they get it. You don't have to really educate them. But if you want to expand outside of that circle, you really got to start figuring out how can you start in incorporating an, an incentive model into Web2. So I think for a very long time, there's going to be a hybrid between Web2 and Web3. It's not going to be like all of a sudden, hey, Web3 overnight, the whole world's running on this. It's going to be a slow progress to eventually get to Web3. But think about it. There's billions of people online using many different programs. This is why I'm kind of, I know people kind of don't like when I say this. I'm actually bullish for Libra once Libra launches because it's going to introduce the very notion of what's this digital thing, this, this stable coin. I never heard of this. What's this thing? Then they start using it. Then they go down kind of the rabbit hole into the whole different Web3 uh, ecosystem. So we have these like big platforms out there, whether it's Facebook, uh, websites even, uh, Shopify stores. You have all these different Web2 properties out there that have billions of users. If we can figure out ways to take, whether it's DAI, whether it's uh, SUS, whether, I don't know, there's a million, whether it's USDT, who cares? There's a million different types of stable coins of different features and properties. If we can figure out ways to inject that into Web2 and make that as an incentive model for them, then the education is automatic. They're self-motivated to figure out what this thing is because they want to achieve that incentive model that we created for them. Right. And I mean, you actually mentioned a very interesting point. So Libra and also some of the other, you know, you know I guess large company initiated stablecoin projects have been creating a lot of noises, but we kind of having really not heard too much about them in the recent times. Um, so, like, do you really uh, still have, I guess, um, a strong kind of hope <laughs> this Libra thing is going to go anywhere, like, in the, in the near future? Like, and if so, like, to what kind of scale? I think 100% Libra will launch. will be launched as a fiat-backed coin, not as their original promise as they have. So they're going to be following full U.S. sanction laws. They're going to be working with a bunch of different banks, whatever banks they are. It's going to be obviously hedged towards the American dollar the most as an American company. So they want to keep that sovereign to American dollar as the strongest hedge for the global uh, economic or say currency wars that we're in currently. And so we will see, and it makes sense. Like if you're going after Alipay and Alibaba within Asia, like I don't want to go on a tangent, but there's a whole different side of story to this. But uh, yeah, I think 100, I don't think I'm, I'll, I'll bet money on this. Libra will launch just from a business aspect. They'll be stupid not to. And specifically, if they follow 100% compliancy with the United States, uh, FinCEN and U whatever, uh, SEC, et cetera. But it will be pegged towards the US dollar. Right. Thank you so much. So just in the interest of time, like we, I, I got like one final question. So I think I can just open the floor to each one of you just for kind of one or two sentences to wrap up. That's the hardest question. Overall. So just to, I, I guess, just to really summarize, like what, like what do you see that's going to be really getting the industry move even forward a little bit better? Like what are you going to be expecting to see? What do you want to see in the industry? Just give us like your final thoughts on this. Maybe we can start. Would, start from, uh, yeah, Amir first, yeah. I'll go back to an incentive. Uh, I think if we can show people that they can earn 6% plus interest rate on a wallet that they can own, and that stable coin can be redeemed as an incentive model, whether it's gamified through Web3 properties, that will automatically rush people in. Like right now, we grew up in a generation where, at least my generation, I'm 35, so I'm like the first year millennial, whatever that is. I never grew up with percentage in the bank. Like my normal is 1%. Whoopie fucking do, 1%. Why would I keep my money in the bank for 1%? 
<laughs> it's a joke, right? But our parents, our parents were used to 8%, 10%, even like higher I've seen back in like the 60s and 70s. They, they had good returns on the dollar and the dollar had more buying power. So their dollar was way better than ours. So if, if the new generation can see, wait, I control my wallet. Uh, wait, I can earn stable coins on all these multiple different platforms. Oh, cool. I can earn now 8% by holding the stable coin here. I'm in. Like the incentives yeah, there. Uh, makes sense. How about you, Jennifer? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really compelling feature and one that everybody, whether you care or know about crypto, can relate to that I could put my money in one place and earn zero or one percent, or I could put it here and earn eight plus percent. So I think that's a really um, nice way to, to get people to appreciate what this technology can do. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm all for like making user experiences clean and also relatable. Um, so just kind of taking the complexity out of storing um, your keys, you know, sending money, onboarding. I think as those, those um, you know, kind of details get better and easier, we'll, we'll find people onboarding much quicker as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how that, that front develops. And I, I think we're already seeing some nice examples in the past year that just takes away that complexity. Makes sense. Leo, you have a few words to add? Yeah, I think that uh, stable coins will grow not where fiat is efficient. Uh, you know, if, if you're paid in, in, in uh, dollars and you bank in dollars and you buy coffees in dollars, then stable coins won't be competitive in, in, the, in the coffee buying game, let's say. But they'll be competitive, uh, like uh, what was mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, receiving better rates. They'll be competitive in terms of uh, international transfers. They'll be competitive in uh, countries that have um, very high uh, degrees of inflation, like Turkey, Argentina. You know, we get uh, comments sometimes from uh, our customer support tickets where people are thanking us for giving them an option to be able to save their wealth. And so, it, it, uh, like I said earlier, stable coins aren't competing with fiat. They're just working well where fiat is inefficient and they're more efficient. And that's where they'll, they'll continue to thrive. Sounds good. Yeah. I see a uh, short-term future and long-term future for stable coins. Uh, short-term, of course, it is uh, interoperability. So Tether is doing a nice job to, uh, to offer a stable coin on all uh, possible platforms. It's actually pretty great because they are all uh, like fighting with each other uh, in terms of attract more and more users. But in the uh, for the industry, uh, for the whole industry, it's actually a good job because uh, they are attracting more users into the crypto itself. So uh, interoperability uh, for stable coins is a pretty nice thing, and I see more and more uh, things in that space. Uh, for the long uh, term future. Uh, we need more uh, applications uh, for like uh, for companies, for enterprises, for uh, regular users uh, from uh, like developed countries or for emerging countries. And uh, one of the uh, important thing I see is that we already have arbitrage opportunity. It means that we have emerging countries; they're pretty low salaries, etc. Uh, people don't have any financial institutions, etc. And we have developed countries uh, with uh, like. Uh, huge wealth with uh, huge prices etc uh, and there is an arbitrage and uh, in online we have a lot of outsource opportunities uh, for uh, people from emerging countries to do like simple tasks and uh, like not so simple tasks but do some job and be rewarded not in like fiat but in in uh, crypto stable coins because it's actually um, it's actually almost uh, automated like you can create system on the smart contract all rewards will be distributed uh, correctly, etc. Uh, so in that uh, in that case, we have automation and at the same time solving uh, the problem of arbitrage between different like different worlds actually uh, worlds without institutions and and uh, without financial uh, education, financial services, etc. And developed countries uh, with high demand on like on on, on simple tasks, on outsourcers, on the, on freelancers, etc. So in that case, uh, I see the long. Uh, term future for stable coins as like crucial factor for uh, solving this issue so this is just my opinion I, and i think uh it's already started actually for example i used to pay in, in cryptocurrency and stable coins for freelancers or 
outsource uh, people who help me with development, etc. And uh, uh, they are not from crypto. So uh, by doing that, I am introducing them uh, into the space. So I, I see the huge potential in that um, uh, in that yeah direction. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much again for Leo, uh, Jennifer, Amir, and Alexa. I thank you for all for attending. Um, this is a great panel. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bye, guys. Bye.